Hi everyone, my name is Brian Doucette and I'm the Canada Research Chair in Urban Change and Social Inclusion at the University of Waterloo School of Planning. I'd like to welcome you to the University of Waterloo and I'd also like to welcome you here to downtown Kitchener. Now I'm going to be honest with you, as a tourist, downtown Kitchener doesn't have a whole lot of major sites and things to see. But as a planning student, there's a lot of very interesting things that are happening here that are relevant for the things that you'll be, lear you'll be learning about in your course. So I want to take you on this short little video tour of downtown to talk about some of the changes, some of the challenges, some of the contradictions, and some of the possibilities that are happening here in downtown. Now I'm not alone on this tour. I've brought with me my dog, Feep. And she'll be joining us as we walk through downtown Kitchener. I wish I could be taking you in person, and hopefully we can someday soon. So join me on this virtual walking tour of downtown Kitchener. So the first place that Feep and I have taken you to is the intersection of King and Victoria. Now this used to be a very industrial uh, corner and downtown was very industrial. There used to be a shoe factory here that's now lofts. And we can see as we scroll around a new condo building, a new building for the University of Waterloo, the LRT stop. Waterloo region is the smallest region in North America to have a full-size LRT system. The railway tracks, which at some point will house a new multimodal transportation center. The current GO station is about 700 meters to my right. And the major offices for Google, both in an old repurposed factory and in a brand new building that opened uh, about five or six years ago. Downtown Kitchener is experiencing a boom at the moment. There's about three billion dollars worth of investment taking place along the LRT line, three billion that took place before the line even opened. And much of that is being concentrated here in downtown Kitchener. And this intersection of King and Victoria is the focal point of it. So there's a lot of activity going on here. There's a lot of construction cranes. There's a lot of new development. And in many ways, what you see here represents what we would traditionally assume and traditionally think of as good city planning. I'll speak more about that at our next stop. So for our next stop, we've come a few blocks away to the intersection of Charles and Gockel. Just around the corner to the left is another LRT stop. And we are here very close to City Hall. That red rotunda in the background over on King Street is Kitchener City Hall. So we're right in the heart of downtown. If you read mainstream or, or major planning books, what you see here in downtown Kitchener is in many ways a textbook example of how we think we should do contemporary urban planning. About 10 years ago, the region of Waterloo enacted two major pieces of policy legislation that have shaped development in the downtown core and across the region. The first was something called the Countryside Line, a development limit around the existing urban footprint of Waterloo Region. This was done because Waterloo Region is, in fact, the fastest growing urban region within Canada, growing at about 2.7, 2.8% per year. But, and, and up until recently, much of this development took place on what was much loved and agriculturally very productive countryside. Waterloo Region has some rural areas to it, some townships, and a lot of this was being eaten up by sprawl. So the idea is if you put a development line around the existing urban footprint, you limit development into that countryside and you limit that sprawl. Working hand in hand with that was the development of the light rail system, which runs through the main spine of Kitchener and Waterloo and will someday hopefully run down to Cambridge. The idea was to shift where most development was taking place from the sprawl on the edges of the region or the edges of the built up area to the existing urban footprint within the core of Kitchener and Waterloo. These two policies of the development line and the country and the, uh, the LRT have worked remarkably well in this regard. Development has switched within about a decade from roughly two thirds of new housing being built 
on greenfield sites on the edges of the region to roughly now two-thirds of new residential development taking place within the existing urban footprint. Much of it in the form of these condominium towers that you can see going up here. So again, when we think of good planning, when we think of sustainable planning, when we think of even things like repurposing old buildings into new community art spaces, 44 Gockel, this building you're looking at now, is, is, is a good example of that. When we think of pedestrianizing streets, there was a wonderful pop-up pedestrianization of this block of Gockel Street uh, last year. It was so successful that the city of Kitchener has decided to make that a permanent change and will be investing in making this small stretch of street, which again connects City Hall with Victoria Park, the city's main urban uh, park space, uh, with a, a pedestrianized space for people walking and cycling and so on. So at first glance, it seems that much of what we're seeing here represents that typical good sustainable planning. But as we go to our next stop, I want to tell you that the situation is a little bit more complex than that. And that some of the questions of who benefit from this planning, who benefits from good planning, um, become more apparent as we look at some of the spaces that have been lost in the wake of this $3 billion worth of investment. Ready to go, Feep? Come on. So there's a downside to all of this development, all of this investment that's been taking place in downtown Kitchener, and that is gentrification. I've taken you here to Weber Street, specifically number 48, and its neighbor number 44, to illustrate the negative side or the negative consequences of all of this investment. Because coming here, it raises important questions of who is this development for, who benefits from it, and who is excluded from it. If we're talking about gentrification and displacement today, we're talking about more than simply middle-class families buying older housing in the inner city, renovating them, and making them their homes. That happens, and that is happening in neighborhoods in and around downtown Kitchener, particularly as people are being priced out of Toronto and are looking for cheaper housing further afield. But we're also talking about a much more fundamental remake of the class urban landscape. Gentrification today is about things like 44 and 48 Weber Street, about rent evictions where a landlord uh, comes in, evicts tenants, renovates the units, and then rents them at higher rents. A lot of these practices are quasi-legal or even illegal, but it happens all the time. We don't know, in fact, how often it happens because it's very difficult to get data on this. My research is less concerned about the numbers around gentrification and displacement and more about the experience, what this means to be living in an apartment like 48 Weber Street and being forced to be evicted uh, and, and leave your home, leave your community and using that lived experience knowledge in order to inform debates political debates, planning debates, policy debates, academic debates about the future of cities and who is who has access to them, who's able to live in them and who's excluded. Gentrification and displacement are about what gets built and what gets renovated, for whom, by whom. But it's also about what doesn't get built. And it's interesting to note that in the downtown development boom in Kitchener, uh, in 2019, there were over 2,600 new units of housing built or under construction. Of that, less than 10 were three or more bedrooms, and virtually none was what we would call affordable housing. So that means that there's an exclusionary displacement to what's happening here as well. A lot of people who may need or want to live downtown won't find housing that's suitable for their needs or their price points in the new development boom that's taking place. So again, if we expand our conceptualization of gentrification beyond just the houses that you see in the background to a much more holistic remake of the city, there's many more forms of indirect displacement that we can see happening here in downtown Kitchener. So what we see in downtown Kitchener is evidence of 
the contradictions of contemporary planning, right? On the one hand, we see all the things we consider to be good planning, intensification, right? Infill developments, building in the existing urban footprint rather than suburban sprawl, transit-oriented development, uh, new light rail, public space improvements, all these things that we consider to be good planning. On the other hand, the contradictions of that are the displacement of low-income communities, the disruption of many of the existing social networks and, and communities that were here in downtown Kitchener. And we see this tension between a new vision and, let's say, uh, a, a more um, working class or low-income or marginal community here. So this makes it such an important site to study when we're looking at contemporary cities, because many of the things that you study in your class and in your program are playing out here in real time as we speak. But it's not all doom and gloom. So to end, I want to take you to a couple of sites just briefly that I think offer both concrete examples of a different model, a different way forward, and also offer possibility for a whole scale reimagining of who the downtown could be for. So join me as we visit uh, two more sites on our tour and we look maybe a bit more optimistically not at what will happen, but with the right planning decisions, with the right leadership, something that could happen. So another idea that's starting to get a bit more traction in local discussions is, is the idea of turning surface parking lots into things like affordable housing. If you come downtown or you go to Uptown Waterloo, you'll see that there's no shortage of surface parking lots, much of which is owned by the cities or the region, so owned by us. So today, these are surface parking lots, but with extreme housing challenges, not just downtown, but in the region and more generally, and these housing challenges not going away anytime soon, tomorrow, these surface parking lots could very well be home for future affordable housing developments. So again, one of the advantages of these publicly owned parking lots downtown, and you find this in uptown as well and in other areas, is that this land is already in public ownership. In a sense, the, the cost of acquiring land to build public housing could be very low or non-existent. Cleaning up this land, getting it ready for development, and then building new affordable housing on it. We're starting to see some movement on this in planning and political discussions here. But for me, this is one of the big potentials of how we can achieve a more sustainable, inclusive, and just downtown core with all the gentrification that's taking place. We have sites here where we could envision and imagine that these could be reinvented, not as more parking lots, not as condos, not as high-end office developments, but as genuinely affordable housing. Veep's still with us here. She's done great on this walk. I hope at some point you'll be able to meet her in person. So our first stop is actually very close to the train station and it's this nondescript old house here. Now this isn't any old house. This is a house that's owned by an organization called the Working Center. If you've not encountered the Working Center, I encourage you to look them up. They've been around for almost 40 years in downtown Kitchener and they provide an array of services from tax assistance to job seeking to affordable housing. This is a building that they own and they've turned it into a number of supportive housing units for unsheltered or vulnerable um, uh, people. This is an example of where dealing with affordable housing isn't about negotiating with developers to get more inclusionary zoning built into privately held land. This is about community organizations owning land, owning property, and building housing that is entirely outside of market forces. This for me, whether it be an organization such as the Working Center, whether it be a community land trust, whether it be a nonprofit co-op, these are all examples for me of the kind of genuinely affordable housing that is necessary to combat gentrification. So rather than trying to get a little bit more uh, investment, a little bit more affordable housing in condominium buildings, this type of non-market housing actually goes beyond the development models that we're seeing here. It counters them by providing housing that is completely outside of market forces, of speculation, and of private sector development. So for me, if we're talking about a sustainable and just 
and equitable downtown, this type of housing, this type of um, ownership of housing has to be central to any kind of uh, pathway forward. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what it looks like. It's not about the look. This obviously looks very nice, but it could be any form of housing. It's more about who owns it and what they do with it and ways in which housing is outside of the realm of profit and speculation. I hope you've enjoyed this tour of downtown Kitchener. I wish I could have taken you here in person and I hope at some point that I can. I hope as well that as you go into your studies and continue with your course, that this tour makes you think about what is good planning, good, uh, what is good development, development for whom, uh, who benefits from this remake of the city that we see in places like downtown Kitchener, and who's excluded from it. Veeps enjoyed this tour, and I hope very much at some point you'll be able to meet her in person as well. Best of luck with your studies, and thanks very much for watching.